Please take your Bibles and turn them to Matthew 5, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles provided for you in the pew in front of you, the shelf just below the pew in front of you. Uh, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. We'll be this morning in chapter 5. The large numbers are the chapter numbers, the small numbers are the verse numbers. We'll be this morning in Matthew 5. Verses 21 through 26, Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26. Please follow along as I read. Jesus speaking says, verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray once more together. Father, as we come now before your word, we need you by your spirit to teach us. We need you to reveal to us the paths of righteousness, that we would, as eager servants of the Lord, walk in them with all of our hearts. We need you to teach us and to show us the way. Help us to do this. As we consider this morning uh, truths perhaps we sometimes pass over or gloss over, truths For some of us, maybe long forgotten, we pray that in a sweet way, in a tender way, you would arrest our attention and that you would awaken our hearts and that you would please help us and equip us and train us to do your will as it's revealed in this passage. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen. In his book, Respectable Sins, Confronting the sins we tolerate, author Jerry Bridges writes the following, quote, the motivation for this book stems from the growing conviction that those of us whom I call conservative evangelicals may have become so preoccupied with some of the major sins of society around us that we have lost sight of the need to deal with our own more refined or subtle sins. Three of the chapters in Bridges' book deal directly with the sin of anger. In his book, Bridges writes, out of a serious biblical concern for holiness among the people of God, among Christians, and his concern when applied to contemporary Western evangelical Christians, which is basically us, is that we can often be overbearingly censorious with respect to what we regard as the more heinous sins of others, murder or adultery or fornication or homosexuality or embezzlement or various forms of addiction, these types of sins. And meanwhile, we can have the tendency to wink at our more refined and subtle sinfulness, the sinfulness that is in our own camp, that is in our own church, that is in our own families that is in our own hearts. Jesus, the one who Christians call Lord, their master, teacher, the one we follow, in this Sermon on the Mount, comes to us in part to rouse us from our moral slumber, to shatter our false pretensions at righteousness. He comes to show us what true purity of heart and true righteousness of life is meant to look like. That's what our passage is about this morning. That really is what the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is about. And it is thus immensely relevant 
and appropriate to our time and our situation. Now, before we look at Jesus' teaching on the subject of anger in our text this morning, and I'll just mention uh, that's as far as we're going to go this morning. I know in the bulletin it says we're going to consider 27 through 30 as well, uh, lust and adultery. Uh, that's my fault. We're not going to get there today. I was preparing this sermon, was going to go that far, and thought, no, we need to be here a little bit longer. We're going to break this up into two uh, messages. So kids, the word search, we're not going to do all those words that are in there. We'll do maybe half of them because uh, that was prepared before I made that change. Anyway, with respect to this text this morning on anger, before we consider what Jesus says about anger, uh, we need to understand what Jesus is doing in terms of the context of his sermon, uh, in terms of his aim and approach. We need to understand how he's framing his presentation of his ethical teaching to his disciples and to the members of his kingdom. So Jesus says, verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And then verse 22, he says, but I say to you, you have heard that it was said to those of old, but I say to you. What is Jesus doing here? Uh, what is he communicating by this formula that is used some six times in chapter 5 in some form or fashion? You've heard that it was said of old, but I say unto you. Understandably, people have questions about Jesus' approach here to teaching the ethics of the kingdom. For example, one might wonder understandably so, is Jesus here saying, I know the Scriptures say this, but I say unto you. In other words, is He setting up His will as an alternative to that which was expressed in Scripture? Don't listen to the Old Testament anymore. I have come. Listen now to me. Well, the answer has to be a resounding no if for no other reason than what we saw last week. If Jesus were taking that approach here, it would directly contradict what Jesus had just said in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. Indeed, not one uh, iota or dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. No, this isn't about me setting myself up in conflict with the Scriptures, rather on the fulfillment of the Scriptures. So we can't understand that to be Jesus' method here. The Scripture said that, but don't listen to that anymore. Now I'm here. Listen to me instead. But what is Jesus doing then? You've heard that it was said to those of old, but I say unto you. Well, we must first note that Jesus is not doing precisely the same thing in every one of these six sections. Six times he uses that little formula in chapter 5. In some cases, Jesus starts with that formula He's returning his disciples to the heart of an ancient command. I think that's what's going on in Matthew 5. Here's the command, the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And he's returning them to the heart of the command, not just the implications for external outward behavior, but the heart of the command itself. In some cases, he will intensify a command, requiring more than what was required under Mosaic legislation, never less. So under the Mosaic law, Certain terms for divorce were tolerated because of the hardness of the hearts of the people of God, but in His new covenant church, among His disciples in a new kingdom, among whom all are to be regenerate, uh, there will be uh, more intense expectations, further expectations in the realm of divorce. In some cases, He is correcting entirely false teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. I think this is what He's doing in 543. Uh, you have heard that it was said, to those of old, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, the Old Testament never says that. My assumption is that was probably a deduction that the scribes of the day had made. Oh, you can love your neighbor, but surely hating your enemy is fine. Well, the Bible never says that, and Jesus is going to correct that false teaching on the part of the scribes and Pharisees. But the bottom line is this. Jesus is not correcting the Bible. He's correcting false or shallow interpretations, understandings, and applications of the Bible. The real contrast in this section in chapter 5 is not between Jesus and the Old Testament. Rather, the contrast is between the meaning of the law according to Jesus and the meaning of the law according to religious tradition and the contemporary Jewish teachers. I think that understanding will hold for each of these teachings of our Lord as we go through this chapter. And I have to believe the major motif here is this, that in Jesus' kingdom, this new kingdom, that he's inaugurating, 
Jesus will require a righteousness that goes beyond the outward legal exactness or correctness of the scribes and Pharisees, and will go instead to the very heart of a disciple. Uh, Jesus' emphasis in His ethical teaching is always on the heart. I appreciated the way uh, Pastor Mike framed that in his prayer. You have the Beatitudes, and then you have in the latter part of chapter 5, matters of the heart. The implications of the law of God on the heart. Jesus is certainly not indifferent toward outward behavior, but He knows as the one who created us, and as the master teacher, the great law giver, the great ethicist, He knows that our outward behavior is always a symptom of what lies within. And therefore, Jesus is concerned about the heart. He's after a righteous heart, a pure heart. Let me just say a word uh, at this moment. Maybe you're here visiting with us. Uh, Maybe you don't often find yourself in the context of gathered churches like this. And you may think that Christians believe uh, that in order to achieve a right standing before God, uh, we need to observe certain religious forms. We need to come to church more so than on Easter and Christmas. Uh, We need to uh, take uh, communion. We need to go to confession or something like that. Uh, You may think Christians believe that, you know, they're right with God because their outward good deeds outweigh their bad deeds and things like that. Uh, My friend, I want you to let Jesus rebuke that kind of false teaching this morning. Jesus has always been about the heart. What is in the heart of a man? What is in the heart of a woman? And we do not believe, as Bible-believing Christians, that everyone who appears externally righteous on the outside is right with God. The Christian religion is a religion of the heart. And we're going to see Jesus direct us to matters of the heart this morning. And now listen, as we approach this passage, one more note before we get to the text itself, there's something further we mustn't miss. Even as we consider the details of these various sections in the coming weeks, in all these things, Jesus is revealing something to us about himself. He's revealing, of course, that he is teaching in continuity with the Old Testament Scriptures. He didn't come to abolish or destroy them or to break them down or to tear them apart page by page. That's true. But also, in his manner of teaching and in the content of his teaching, Jesus is revealing something about himself. Namely, he's putting himself on par with the Old Testament Scriptures. He's asserting his fiat as the true and greater Moses as the foretold prophet who would come to announce the commandments of God. And he will speak with unparalleled authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. I want you to notice Jesus doesn't speak like other rabbis. No rabbi in first century Jerusalem would stand up and say, you have heard that it was said in the Scriptures, but I say unto you. No one would ever speak that way until Jesus. This is an assertion of his authority his fiat, his right to be the sole interpreter of the law of God and of the Word of God. And from here on out, all interpretation of the law of God will go through the person of Jesus. He brings a new interpretive principle to the law in his incarnation, in his work, and in his life. Okay, now let's come to our text this morning, the issue of anger and their are two questions I want to ask to frame our time, two simple questions to get at Jesus' meaning in these verses. The first question we'll ask is, what does Jesus have to say about murder and anger? And number two, how should we apply Jesus' teaching here in our lives today? What does Jesus have to say about murder and anger in this passage, and how should we apply Jesus' teaching here to our lives? Consider with me in the first place, what does Jesus have to say? about murder and anger. Look again at the text, if you would, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Okay, stop there. Jesus is citing the Ten Commandments here, uh, particularly the Sixth Commandment. You shall not murder. This was part of the law given to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai through Moses. Of course, murder didn't become a sin at Mount Sinai. Uh, When Cain murders his brother Abel in Genesis 4, murder was a sin. But murder in the form of the sixth commandment is codified and given a special place of prominence and priority among 
divine legislation for the Israelite people. And so the Jews, they would memorize the Ten Commandments. They would teach their children to memorize the Ten Commandments. They would incorporate the Ten Commandments in their worship. It had a special place to play in their lives as a people. And you shall not murder. The Sixth Commandment is prominent among those commandments. But Jesus seems to be concerned in this passage, the passage before us, with a surface-level kind of interpretation of the commandment that was prevalent among the scribes and the Pharisees. I think this is what leads him to say in verse 22, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. I think it's possible among the religious teachers of Jesus' day, uh, some saw the sixth commandment uh, only going as far as speaking to the issue of physical murder. If you have steered clear of homicide, you are clear of the sixth commandment. But Jesus, the master teacher, the greater Moses, wants us to see more here. He wants to go to the heart of the matter, as he's going to do with all of these commandments. His ethical teaching will encompass more than just our outward actions. He wants to address what's going on within a person. He wants to apply the sixth commandment to the heart of a person, not just his outward actions. Jesus wants to create a category for a kind of murder that doesn't involve thrusting a knife into another person, but involves rather anger, hatred, and bitterness, and derision expressed toward others in the heart. So he says, verse 22, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Okay, a few observations here on verse 22. I don't think we should understand that Jesus is establishing a kind of scale of escalating offenses with corresponding kind of escalating punishments here. Uh, So I don't think the text is working in this way, you know, that if you're angry, that's one thing. Uh, and, and, and then if you insult your brother, that's a little worse. And then if you say, you fool, well, that's the ultimate big sin. And then the corresponding judgment, you have the judgment, the counsel, the hell of fire. I don't think that's how it's working here. These offenses and the penalties are all of a piece in this passage. Jesus' point is that these sins of anger will lead us to ruin. A further observation, Jesus says, do not be angry with your brother. I'll simply note I don't think we need to understand Jesus to be saying here that every single form and expression of anger is wrong and sinful. Otherwise, I think he'd be indicting himself. Jesus did express righteous anger in certain settings. And at some point, he would even require his people to express a kind of righteous anger and indignation. He's not talking about that in this passage. Jesus is talking about our everyday garden variety expressions of anger that are expressions of sin, that are expressions of wickedness, in the heart, lashing out at others, insulting others, maybe hurling epithets at others, harboring anger, resentment, and bitterness toward others in our hearts. Maybe it's never verbalized, but it's there at all times under the surface. Maybe it's imagining or fantasizing about verbally dressing down other people and shaming them in front of others. Or maybe it's actual hatred, wanting harm to come to another person. These are the kinds of things I think that Jesus is condemning in our passage. He's saying, my disciples should not do these things. They should not be marked by these attitudes and these behaviors. So he speaks first to those who are angry with their brother. If you are angry at your brother, he says, you are liable to judgment. In other words, don't think, well, I haven't actually murdered anybody, Jesus. I haven't murdered the guy or harmed him physically, so I've done nothing wrong. Now, Jesus is saying anger in your heart toward your brother is a kind of murder of the heart. Jesus is saying don't tolerate that kind of anger in your heart toward your brother. Then he speaks next of those who insult their brother. The text, if you're reading the ESV, doesn't note this, uh, but in other translations it might acknowledge, it might read uh, that whoever says raka against his brother, R-A-C-K, or C-A, excuse me, raka, whoever calls someone by raka, what does that mean? Uh, that means empty-headed or bone-headed. We might think you know, you're stupid or you're a moron or something like that. Whoever speaks that way towards someone else is liable to the council. 
In other words, this is indicting speaking with derision and cruelty and mockery toward others. And then Jesus says, whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus is basically saying, my disciples are not to dress people down verbally, whether it's your enemies, whether it's your children, whether it's your spouse or your employees, whether it's your coworkers or the person behind the counter. My disciples don't do that. We don't speak that way toward other people. You may not attempt as my disciples to injure people with your words. That falls under the censure, Jesus says, of the sixth commandment not to murder. And what does Jesus say? Notice in the text, verse 22, what does he say will be the outcome of those who live this way, think this way, act this way, and speak this way in anger and in rage, insulting others, belittling others? You act this way, living your life in sinful anger, you are liable to judgment even to the hell of fire. What's Jesus' point? This is serious. Don't stand there self-righteously, self-assuredly, and say, I'm not murdering anybody. i got a clean record. No, no, no. This kind of thing, anger in the heart, bitterness, rage, insulting others, this will lead you to hell itself. This is enough to ruin you. This is enough to place you under God's judgment. And I don't think Jesus is saying, you know, being angry at someone in your heart is the same thing in terms of scale as actually murdering someone physically. But what he is saying is both offenses will bring you under the judgment of God. You cannot sit there self-righteously and talk about how outwardly you've never brutalized somebody. No, if you've hated them in your heart, been bitter against them in your heart, been angry at them in your heart, you come under the judgment and censure of the sixth commandment. And Jesus is saying, wake up. Like, I want your heart, man. I want to know what's in there. You need to be righteous from within. Not just learning how to curb your outward behavior. No, Jesus is after a righteousness of the heart. Jesus is trying to impress upon his hearers, his disciples, the utter seriousness of this sin. He will not allow us to think of it as a respectable sin, something we can wink at. You give yourself over to anger in your heart, you can expect condemnation. Don't care if you've never committed homicide, my law goes to the heart where maybe no one outside can see, but where God can see. And Jesus is saying, I want your heart. And I demand that anger and strife be dealt with there in the heart. And where does Jesus then go from here? Jesus then extends the argument further in verse 23. He begins to talk about what obedience to this command should look like positively in relationships. So for the man or woman committed to mortifying anger and bitterness in the heart, how will he behave in light of the offenses that he commits and in light of those offenses committed against him? And here, Jesus wants to emphasize the necessity and the urgency of dealing with anger and strife in our hearts promptly and thoroughly. Like, when should I deal with anger? Like, immediately. As soon as you recognize it. You can't let it fester. Can't let the sun go down on your anger. You identify anger and bitterness in your heart, or you can identify that in the heart of someone else towards you. You need to resolve it promptly, immediately, fully, and thoroughly. So Jesus says, he gives the first example here in verse 23, so if you are offering your gift at the altar... And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now hang on. Did you get that? The implications of what Jesus is saying here? I think this has to be one of the Lord's commands that is most consistently unheeded. It's not uncommon at all for people to walk into the gathering to worship God, when they are harboring and nursing anger and bitterness in the heart, sometimes toward the very people in the room. And they'll even lift their hands in worship, bow their heads in prayer, take their notes in their notebook during the sermon, and all the while, living in anger and in strife, 
toward their brothers and sisters. Do you feel the weight of what Jesus is saying? Say, don't, don't worship me. Well, there's a grudge or a beef with someone else in the church or someone else in your family. No, go be reconciled. Make it right. Extend forgiveness. Do what needs to be done, and then come worship me. This is of a piece of the kind of statements we read elsewhere where the Lord says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The outward forms don't matter to me if the heart is wrong. If murder of the heart is being nursed, don't come into my worship, deal with the issue, and then come. I knew a a woman in a previous church. Uh, She played the piano for a time, made a trial of it. Let's just say she wasn't cutting the mustard, okay? Uh, Often the wrong chord, key, that kind of stuff. And the decision was made, we need to sweetly ask the sister, um, we need to redirect her service elsewhere. And so an elder made an effort to do that. The sister was so offended that she would be asked not to serve in this way, but in another way, that from that point forward, she ceased to talk to that elder. She'd see him in the hallway, she'd turn the other way. Have you ever experienced something like that? Here are our two sisters down in the nursery or over at the playground, and one of the sisters says a careless word, something about how we don't allow our kids to do this. The other mom gets offended. Of course, doesn't say anything to the other mom. But she thinks, you know, you know what? I've had it with her. Um, I'm just not going to talk with her anymore. And you know what? It's a big enough church. You know, I know where they sit. We'll just sit somewhere else. Uh, friends, we could chuckle at that. But that very thing comes under the indictment of Jesus' words here. Jesus is serious about this. He's telling us to deal with the anger that's in our hearts. It must be dealt with immediately. It must be dealt with thoroughly. Be reconciled to your brother. Be reconciled to your sister. Then come and offer your gift. Cleanse your hands and cleanse your heart, and then come into my worship. Will we heed the word of our Lord? I recognize sometimes there are some people that you can't reconcile with. I recognize that. You've done all you can to achieve reconciliation. Well, I think you're clear in the matter. Don't think Jesus would object to you coming back to church. But when there is a clear breach of relationship, strife, anger toward another, either from your heart to theirs or from theirs to yours, Jesus' word is reconcile. Address it promptly and thoroughly. And we have another situation envisioned here uh, for the positive obedience of this command in verse 25. Come to terms quickly, Jesus says, with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. What is Jesus' basic point? I think he's saying, uh, don't Don't rely on the criminal justice system to externally impose upon you reconciliation. Don't let it get to that level. Here someone has something against you, there's a breach in relationship, there's anger and tension and strife, settle it. You shouldn't have to go to court to have reconciliation achieved and justice extracted from you. No, settle it now, settle it immediately, don't let it escalate. Go to him now, go to her now and deal with the issue. The right time to resolve anger, Jesus is saying, is immediately. As soon as we recognize we are at enmity, we must resolve it. And what's the point here? We may not, as the Lord's disciples, tolerate long-standing, persistent strife, animosity, and bitterness in our relationships. We deal with it. We do what we must as the Lord's disciples to reconcile and to make things right immediately and thoroughly. It's not unlike the way my wife and I talk to our children. You have certain house rules. You know, when one of the kids has offended the other, we require them to go to the other and say what they did. Say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Saying sorry into your armpit is not acceptable in the De Prima house. I'm sorry, I hit you. Will you forgive me? And what I might say to them is that in this house, kids, 
We ask for forgiveness. In this house, kids, we don't go to bed angry. But Jesus is saying, in my kingdom, we will not hold grudges against each other. In my kingdom, we will not harbor bitterness and anger in the heart. That's not becoming of my disciples. No, I call you to a higher standard. A righteousness far better, by the way, than the scribes and Pharisees who were consumed with anger. No, we will mortify anger in the heart, and we'll do it immediately, and we'll do it thoroughly. One way to honor the sixth commandment in Christ's will for His disciples is by keeping short sin accounts, by reconciling quickly, and by doing whatever is needed to live at peace with your neighbor. Well, now I'd like to transition to points of application. In the time that remains, the second question I wanted us to ask the text, what should be our response as the Lord's people to what Jesus is teaching here. In a sense, I've been giving application throughout, but now I want to be a little more focused and direct. Three points of application this morning, and then we'll be done. How should we apply Jesus' teaching to our lives? Number one, we should be sobered and humbled by Jesus' standard of righteousness expressed here in this text. We should be sobered and humbled by Jesus' standard of righteousness expressed here in this text. I think this was probably the effect the original teaching had on the disciples sitting there. It sobered them up. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, uh, you shall not murder. And here, disciples elbows to the other, yeah, we've heard this sermon before, I'm so glad I'm not a murderer. They realize that Jesus expects more. Jesus is after my heart. And if this is the standard, who can stand? Who who could boast a record that's unstained by anger? Who could do that? Maybe among the disciples there were a couple who were fighting with one another, nursing a grudge against each other. I, I hope, I'd like to imagine that after the sermon, they go to Jesus and they're just sort of overwhelmed and convicted by the message and they say to Jesus, you know, we, we've been at odds with each other. I've been angry in my heart toward John. I've been angry in my heart toward Peter. And we see now that won't work. It's not right. Can't honor the Lord and live like that. Who among us can boast purity in this issue, righteousness in this issue when this is the standard? I used to work in a a plant, worked for a company called Cintas, and I worked in the back unloading trucks, and there you had on the wall the uh, whiteboard that says, you know, this number of days without an accident. And you'd have, you know, like 400 days, and then Bill would stub his toe, and have to file a claim, and then you erase it, right? We're back down to zero, and then you count it back up, and there might be incentives attached to that and all. Well, if I asked you, How many days have you been clear of this interpretation of the command? Who among us could boast a week free from this kind of sinful anger in our hearts against others? And I just encourage you to think for a moment the kinds of behaviors and attitudes very common to us that come under the censure of Jesus' words here. Practically all forms of anger are indicted by this passage. Practically all of them. You might think, first of all, of just that kind of perpetual anger that's always kind of the current underneath. It's like a river that's flowing under the bridge at all times. Some of us walk around always with that undercurrent of anger. We always got a beef with somebody, and it's going to come out at the slightest provocation, at our spouse, at our kids, at someone at work, at a friend. We're just always living in a kind of anger, just always there. And maybe I can't exactly diagnose why, but I'm always angry. It's always with me. A kind of perpetual anger, I think, often has its root in the very simple fact that we don't get our way in life. And so I'm not getting my way. The ball's not tipping my way. Life is hard. There's all kinds of occasions for me to get angry. And so I'm just kind of always angry because we live in a fallen world and life is hard. Sometimes it's not that life isn't going our way, but it's that life is getting in our way. Sometimes it's that our kids are getting in our way. I had an expectation for how this evening was going to go, and you ruined it. Aren't I entitled to one night of peace? 
you know, I, I worked hard today. Do you have to talk to me in that way? And we respond with anger. We get inflamed and we blow up, right? Because there's this undercurrent of anger, an expectation that life's to be an unbroken boulevard of green lights, and it's supposed to be a bed of roses and things like that, and we, we're entitled. And so we're always angry because life isn't going my way and people are getting in my way. I'll tell you, sometimes we could get angry because God is in our way. You know, this week, I uh, found out we have to replace our roof. Okay, that, that dreaded kind of, you know, can okay, we go longer? Well, is there hail damage up there? Can I file a claim? That didn't happen, okay? Ball didn't tip our way. Now, if I respond in anger, who am I angry at? Am I angry at the guy who told me the bad news? Am I angry at the previous homeowner? Am I angry at whoever invented, you know, the, the roofing substances that can endure longer? God gave me this house. God created the world, and roofs deteriorate. And I'm unhappy with the providence of God, and I'm angry. Is that a just response? But what's happening is that incident is exposing a kind of undercurrent of anger that's always under the surface, that can erupt at any time. Maybe one of those frequent ways in which we violate this passage. There's also the kind of anger that takes the form of shouting and insulting and dressing others down, speaking to people in derision and out of rage and anger. This would include verbal abuse. This would include creating an atmosphere of intimidation and fear, maybe in the workplace or maybe in the family, an environment of psychological terror or aggression. Through your words, you're angry and you grit your teeth. I'll just say, I want to speak to the men for a minute. I'll say, this kind of expression of anger where I've been shouted at or cussed at or dressed down verbally, as a matter of fact, has come more from women than from men. I don't know if that's unusual or not, but I want to speak to the brothers for a minute, acknowledging that sisters can be guilty of this also. I want to speak to a very specific expression that anger can take, and that is the form of kind of physical or emotional abuse, psychological terror that can be created in the home. Now, men, we can't sit here and say, I've never laid hands on my wife. I've never slapped her upside the face. I've never thrown her down on the bed. But I ask you, have you ever clenched your fists in the presence of your wife? Have you ever shouted at your kids through gritted teeth? You're a man. You're the stronger vessel. You're intimidating. You can be very intimidating to women and to children. And don't think, it it might pass muster in a court of law to say, I never laid hands on her, judge. But it won't pass muster at the bar of Christ if in your heart and through your behavior you've intimidated your wife. You've intimidated your kids. You've grabbed them by the collar. You listen to me. What are you doing? I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you, and I can hurt you. And just because you have the self-control to never level a blow does not mean you are clear of this passage. In your heart, you are expressing anger and rage and aggression. I'll just say, if there's a man here this morning who's struggling with that, please, please, come to one of your pastors. We're not going to try to shame you. We're going to try to help you. It needs to be dealt with. That kind of anger in the heart will drag you down to hell. You can't live that way. It's not safe, not only for those in your home, It's not safe for you, and for the love of your soul, find one of us, or find a trusted brother in this church. Say, I need help. I don't want to live angry and rage all the time. Another kind of anger is anger that maybe is never externalized, but there's always a storm within. Do you do this? You know, you're you're at work, and your boss gives you some ridiculous demand that you can't possibly do in the time that he's allotted to you and you smile, sure thing, boss, and then you get in your car, and you have a conversation for the 30 minutes on the drive home. Of all the things that if you had the temerity, you'd say to him, you'd really let him have it. Well, you didn't express it in the office, but it's in your heart. Some people will actually fantasize about letting people have it, about, oh, 
I would have said this. And you know, they're in the shower, and they're, they're having this inner conversation about what they might have said if they could get that guy. And some people, people have confessed this to me, they've gone as far as fantasizing about murdering people. It's gotten that bad. If I could just get my hands around his neck, if I could just get her against the corner, that kind of thing is within our hearts. There's a kind of anger. We may never say it. We may never express it. But God knows. God sees our hearts. Sometimes anger can take the form of actual hatred. Now, hatred doesn't mean that you want the person to be killed. It just means you want them to be harmed in some way. And you really wish that on others. I'd love to see her embarrassed in front of the group. Oh, that'd be great. It'd be so just if she'd get what was coming to her. And we fantasize about that and think about that. It's an expression of hatred in the heart. The bottom line is this, brothers and sisters, for all practical purposes, our anger is virtually never justified. It's virtually never justified. Now, someone here is thinking, well, we'll talk about righteous anger, though, right? Okay, buddy, listen. Like, I don't walk around like this righteous crusader for the holy and just standards of God all day long. 99% of my anger isn't that kind of righteous indignation, standing up for the Lord and the, you know, the wickedness that is carried out every day, and I'm going to defend his honor and his justice and his holiness. There's a category for that. But come on, let's be honest. I'm not the only one, am I? Most of the anger that rises up within me is not driven by righteous concern for the holiness of God. It's driven by my anger and hatred toward others. It's driven by my selfishness. It's driven by me not getting my way, and it's not justified. It's sinful in the eyes of God. How many times were you angry this week, and how many times was it righteous, holy, pure, and godly indignation? Well, friends, if we're going to take this line against our anger in our hearts, I will warn you, you will have to be countercultural in some ways, because the world will furnish you with plenty of language and expression to dress up your anger and to justify it. I was just blowing off some steam, man. Blowing off some steam. You know what that expression is? That's like in the industrial age, steam-powered things. Pressure would build up, and then the little thing would have to open up, and steam would come out. I, I was just blowing off some steam. Uh, you know, you really have a right to be angry. The way he treated you, you have a right to be angry. People will talk to us in this way, and we'll think, well, I'm for my rights. That's right, my rights have been violated. Again, I blow off some steam. Can I fly off the handle a little bit? How about the friend that says, well, you know, you could always vent to me. You know, it's a safe place. And that's not a safe friendship. It's a friendship that will drag you down to hell, that will encourage angry venting. Come on. Tell me the goods. Let's all, let's all hear. Tell me what happened. You know you're safe with me. People will talk that way. The culture will furnish you with all kinds of reasons, all kinds of ways to justify your anger. Friends, I just encourage you, listen to Jesus' words here. Wake up. Don't be deluded. Sinful anger will lead to your ruin. Take it seriously. Mortify it. Nip it in the bud. Kill it. Lest it kill you. We should be sobered and humbled by the warnings of this passage. And my friend, not only should we be sobered and, and humbled, it should lead us to repentance. If we find that we have been angry people, that we do come under the indictment of this passage, we must go to God with our anger. We must repent of our sins. We must look to Him for grace, not only to cover our sins, but then to help us to walk in the way we should walk. That would be a godly response. Okay, application number two. I need to move more quickly. Number two, as Jesus' disciples... We should respond to this teaching with obedience. We should respond to it with obedience. Not just being humbled, being sober, and being penitent. We've got to have a battle plan to fight our anger and to walk in the paths of righteousness. And I want to be as practical as I can be at this point. You want to be holy. You want to fight your sin. You want to walk in righteousness. You hunger and thirst for this, kinds of right, this kind of righteousness. Well, you're not going to be successful in mortifying anger in your heart without some kind of plan. Well, we never become holy by osmosis. We don't become like Christ by sitting there. No, there's things we can do. 
to help us to walk in the paths of obedience. A few practical encouragements, brothers and sisters. Number one, uh, we have to start by seeing our anger as sinful. We have to see it for what it is. This is offensive to Christ. This is dishonoring to God. This is unbecoming of those who have been united to the Lord Jesus and have entered the kingdom of heaven. We must see it for what it is. And we must see it not only as sinful, but as dangerous for us. Uh, He who gives into this is liable to the hell of fire. I must mortify my anger. Uh, Secondly, we must recognize that we will be presented all the time with occasions to get angry. All the time, all around us. So, so, so if you have a spirit that is inclined toward anger, you get offended, you get worked up easily, you walking through this life is kind of like an alcoholic walking all the time through a liquor store. Because the world's fallen. People are going to sin against you. You're going to sin yourself and disappoint yourself. Uh, you're going to have financial anxieties. You're going to have people mistreat you. You're going to have all kinds of things that can provoke an angry response. You know, all kinds of occasions to break this passage. I have to recognize I live in a fallen world. And, and every day I walk into opportunities to sin against God in terms of sinful anger. And I think some of us would be helped in this area if we just lowered our standards for what life is supposed to give us. We shouldn't expect life's just going to be rosy and amiable and agreeable at all times. Life's going to be a cakewalk. No, life is hard. It's all kinds of things that could make us angry if we allow them to. We need to recognize the terrain. We need to recognize the battlefield if we're going to be successful in our fight against anger. We should recognize every day I can live in anger. Every offense against me could be an occasion for violating the will of my Lord. Every time the ball doesn't tip my way, I have a choice to make. And that's going to happen every day, every week, every year. Thirdly, practically, we should pursue the virtues that make for peace. You're not just going to win by playing defense. You're going to need some offense. So pursue the virtues of patience. Pursue the virtue of meekness, the virtue of gentleness. Walk in the paths of righteousness. Go after those things that will crowd out anger in your heart. It, it, it's kind of like, like you have a, a garden, a flower bed, and you think, well, the way I'll make these flowers grow is I'll just weed all the time. I'll just pull all the weeds out. Well, that's playing defense. You've got to mortify your anger in your heart, right? But you also have to fertilize. You have to pour water on the flower. You have to nurture it. So similarly, we must mortify anger in our hearts. So we must build up moral fortifications against sin by seeking by God's help through His Spirit's help to grow in patience and in virtue and in kindness and in gentleness and in peace and in goodwill. These will help us practically. A fourth practical encouragement, surround yourself with friends who will not encourage an angry spirit, but will rebuke it. Can we just covenant together here, members of Emmanuel Church, in light of this teaching from our Lord? We're not going to encourage anger in one another. Someone's angry, frustrated, expressing that to you, well, it may not be responsible to, you know, quote Matthew 5 immediately to them, but it certainly is not appropriate to say, yeah, I I get it, man. You you, you go. You, You have your little pity party. You vent. It's safe to do that with me. No, let's help one another. Brother, sister, I know I can experience that anger myself when things don't go my way. I could understand how how you could feel that way. Let me encourage you, though. uh, Pursue a godly disposition toward your boss. Can we, let's pray for him right now. I'm gonna pray that the Lord gives you peace and help as you seek to carry yourself in a way that would honor Christ in this very difficult relationship. Let's have that kind of relationship and carriage with one another. Uh, Finally, I would say fight anger with the gospel. Fight anger with the gospel. Maybe I'll close here. That sounds like a really great thing to say. We're going to be gospel-centered people. Fight your anger with the gospel, brother. No, but seriously, what does the gospel do in us and for us? Changes the way we see ourselves? Should change the way we see others? If God has set aside His wrath, or better yet, has been pleased to exact his wrath on a substitute in my place that I might be forgiven. Once his enemy, now seated at his table as a child of God. 
If we recognize and are overwhelmed by the grace of God shown toward us, we will begin to see people differently. We'll begin to be oriented toward others on the terms of grace, the gospel, and forgiveness, and mercy, and peace. Don't see people as obstacles in my way. God didn't view me that way. No, God showered His tender love, and He was forbearing, and He was forgiving, and He was kind, and He was gracious, and everything merciful. Well, how will I then live in bitterness and anger and strife against my neighbor? Will I not show to them the kind of grace that was shown to me? Will I not be marked by the kind of patience and kindness that is mine in Christ, that is mine in the gospel? My friends, meditate on what Jesus has done for your soul. It's the greatest possible medicine uh, to prescribe to the anger that is in our hearts. We're gospel people, therefore we may not be angry people. Rather, we should live at peace and goodwill with all men. There was a final application. I won't take time to develop it. I'll just state it. We should all take Jesus' words about the priority necessity and urgency of reconciliation seriously. We should all take Jesus' words about the priority, necessity, and urgency of reconciliation seriously. Don't soften Jesus' words here. It's possible someone here needs to send a text to someone else today before we come back for evening service. And it may require you to express some things that are embarrassing to you. I had a sister tell me not long ago she got an email from someone who literally like 10 years ago had been offended by some trivial thing and had heard a sermon like this one and was convicted and sent an email to this woman and said, I've been nursing bitterness against you for 10 years. And the sister was like, I don't even know what she's talking about. (laughs) I barely remember the person. Friends, do not come into the worship of God when there's murder in your heart against your brother or sister, be reconciled. Pursue peace. Pursue reconciliation with your brother, with your sister. If you've been listening to this message this morning and you recognize this standard that our Lord has for us as His disciples, it's possible you feel very convicted. You feel, in in light of this, who can stand? You recognize, i got to go to God in my heart and deal with some things that have been there for too long. My encouragement to you is this, Jesus sinners does receive. If you feel that you've been living in sinful anger, you recognize you need to change, go to Jesus Christ, even now in this last song we're going to sing. Say, Lord, I've not been right, I've not been living as I should. I've been living in anger, that current is always there. Help me, change me, save me, forgive me. Teach me how to walk in the paths of righteousness. Don't let me live in bitterness and anger and hatred. You go to Jesus Christ and he'll receive you. He'll save you. He'll forgive you and he'll help you to walk as you ought. Let's pray together. My Father, it's impossible to come before a passage like this and to not be aware of how much we fall short of your righteous standards, those expressed by our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Uh, So many of us just painfully aware of sin in our hearts. Lord, we long to be forgiven and we long to do better by your grace and with your help. So, Lord, we pray those two things. We pray that you would forgive us of all of our sins, every bitter word we've said to another person, every wicked and angry thought we've had, either against you or against our fellow man, a hatred at times that we've nursed, uh, fantasies we've entertained, dressing people down or harming them, all the ways we've sinned against you. We pray in the hope and in the sure confidence that through Jesus Christ and his blood on the cross, we can be forgiven and can be made right with you. But Lord, we pray also 
as those who are forgiven, as those who have been made right through what our Lord has done on the cross. We don't want to live in anger or bitterness anymore. We don't want to any longer live for ourselves. We don't want to live in rage. We don't want to live in strife. We would want to live in peace and in goodwill and in righteousness, true righteousness of the heart. Well, we want it. We hunger and thirst for it. Please work within us. Fill us with power by your Spirit to mortify our sins and to be awake and alive to righteousness. We want the virtues of patience and humility, of gentleness and kindness and self-control. We want the virtue of love toward others, not anger. So we pray, Father, that you would deal a death blow to our anger through your word and through your spirit, and that you would awaken us, awaken within us the virtues that make for righteousness and peace. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen.